Hi everybody and welcome to Unit 2 Notes Part 2. Today we're going to be talking about modern atomic theory. This is a really abstract topic and it's kind of hard to get your mind around all of it. So don't worry, I'm going to definitely, um, as we go through, focus on the parts that are going to be most important to you. All right, so just to give you a little idea as to what, um, more a little bit more physics than chemistry, um, there's basically two ways of describing nature. There's what is known as quantum mechanics, and that's for very small pieces of matter moving very, very quickly. There's what's known as Newtonian mechanics, and this is just kind of classic physics, describing how matter moves. Um, and to give you just an idea of the difference when you would use one or the other, all right, for a proton, so a proton inside of our atom, that particle, which is so small, is large enough that its behavior can be described by classic Newtonian mechanics. For a photon, which is a little piece of light, a little piece of energy, you'd need quantum mechanics to describe it. Well, in chemistry, what we care about is the electron. And our job today is gonna try and to be, is to is to try and describe where the electron is in the atom and kind of why it behaves the way it does. All right, so right now you have a lot of different terms going on and a lot of different definitions, all of which are in your notes, so I'm gonna go pretty quickly. We have what's known as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It is impossible to know both the location and the direction of the atom. So that really famous Bohr model, also known as the Rutherford Bohr model, what is great to visualize, but the model itself was too specific as to where the um, electrons are located. They thought of the electrons kind of rotating around the nucleus like the um, planets rotate around the sun, and that's not what actually happens. Instead, modern atomic theory focuses on what's known as Schrodinger's equations, which are equations that talk about the probability of where you're going to find electrons. We're not going to be looking at this through his actual equations at all, but this is going to give us our idea for what we call quantum numbers. All right, our three uh, principles and rules here, we're going to actually leave and I'm going to bring them up um, when we work with them a little bit later on. So, modern atomic theory uses what are known as quantum numbers to describe where the electrons can be found. And the idea of this, you want to think of it as trying to give each electron within an atom a unique address, an address that no one else has. All right. So first off, we have what is known as the principal quantum number. This one we're going to use a lot. All right. So it tells you what we call the energy level of the electron. Energy levels are a lot like the rings, if you want to try and visualize it, in that Bohr model. It's a distance from the nucleus. So if you're in the first energy level, you're closest to the nucleus. If in your second, you're getting a little farther away and so forth. All right. Um, and it gives you a general idea as to the size of the electron cloud. The greater the principal quantum number, okay, if you're in the seventh energy level, that's a pretty large atom. All right, so how do we figure out how many electrons can live on each energy level? The greatest number of electrons that can be found in each level can be calculated using this equation, 2n squared. So if you're first in your first energy level, n becomes 1. Well, 2 times 1 is 2. Or I'm sorry, 1 squared is still 1, and then 2 times 1 is 2. So in the first energy level, you can have 2 electrons. Second energy level is going to give you 8. And then finally, that third energy level, you can have 18 and so on. All right. And then a little more practice. This is simple math, so I know you guys can do it. Fourth energy level could have 32 electrons. Okay, great. All right, so that's our principal quantum number. And the principal quantum number gets the abbreviation N. I have no idea why the abbreviations are the way they are, but just so you know that they, they exist. Okay, so let's talk about the second quantum number. This is another one that we're going to use a lot, and it's going to help us understand the periodic table better. Uh, the second quantum number, which gets the abbreviation lowercase l, okay, which is hard to type out, so lowercase l, tells you what's known as the sublevel of the electron. Now, here's where you need to memorize some things, and this is right here. When we talk about sublevels, you need to know how many electrons live in each sublevel. The S can hold two electrons, P can hold six. D can hold 10, and F can hold 14. All of that really, really important to remember. The shapes, I'm not worried about the shapes. They are there. You can certainly read a little bit more about them in your textbook. But what I really want you to come away with is what the sublevels are and how many electrons are in each. Now, a little bit more math. 
the number of sublevels for each energy level equals the value of the principal quantum number for that level. Ah, so what does that mean? Well, it just means that in your first energy level can only have one sublevel. And if you can only have one sublevel, that sublevel is S. The second energy level can have two sublevels because it's the second. And that's going to be the S and the P. The third energy level, you're starting hopefully to see the pattern, can have three sublevels. They're going to have an S, a P, and a D. All right, great. Now, to go back to that little equation, we already figured out that the maximum number of electrons in the first energy level was two. Well, it only has a S sublevel, and S can only have two. So that makes sense. We figured out that that second energy level, all right, remember, can have eight electrons. Well, S is two, P is six, two plus six is eight. So hopefully you're seeing the pattern, okay? All right, now, our third quantum number, which gets the abbreviation lowercase m, again, I have no idea. Um, this one we're not gonna use a whole lot. Um, it's really focused on the um, orientation in space of what we call orbitals. If you go on to take AP chemistry, you'll talk a lot more about this. Uh, but what we wanna take away from it is this term orbital. Orbital means a pair of electrons. All right, so orbital means a pair of electrons. The space occupied by a pair of electrons is called an orbital. So how many orbitals are in each sublevel? Well, it's a pair. S can hold two electrons, so that's one pair. P can hold six electrons. How many pairs is that? That's three. D can hold 10, that's five pairs. F can hold 14, 14. that's seven pairs. Nice and straightforward. That's gonna come up a little bit later. All right, the final quantum number, which is known as the spin quantum number, and it gets the abbreviation S, that one actually makes sense, um, is states that no two electrons can occupy the same space. So what that means is so far we have gone down with these three quantum numbers, we're able to give an address to electrons, um, but in the end, two electrons could still have the same address and we can't have that. So we say that one of the electrons is spinning clockwise and one of them is spinning counterclockwise. We don't know that. That's just what we say is going on um, to give them a different address. All right, again, I know this is abstract, but let, let me um, stop now and I'm gonna show you how we're gonna end up using this. Hi, everybody. We're going to now talk about the more practical side of those quantum numbers and where we're going to actually be using them. And someplace that we'll be using um, on and off throughout the year is what's known as an electron configuration. All right. Now, the electron configuration chart is something you're going to be using a lot. So it's important that you write this down really neatly. Um, in addition to using this chart, you are um, showing how much you know about quantum numbers by actually being able to develop the chart. So let's talk about what I mean there. Okay. So we're going to start out just talking about those quantum numbers again. In our first energy level, you have one sublevel. What is that sublevel? It's an S. How many electrons can, hold, um, can S hold? It can hold two. All right, great. Directly under this, second energy level, you have two sublevels. The first one's S, and it can hold two. The second sublevel is P, and it can hold six. All right, we're going to continue down. Third energy level has an S that holds two, has a P that holds six. It also has a D, so we call that 3D, and Ds can hold 10. Okay, we then have the four. Again, nice and lined up, good handwriting when you're putting this in your notes. So pause this if you need to, so you can make it look really nice. Four also has the F sublevel, which can hold 14. All right, so now we're going to five. Now, there is not a fifth sublevel, and we'll talk about that later, so don't worry about that. So we're gonna go to six. All right, and we're gonna end up here with seven. 
okay? And so we're going to leave it at that, all right? I realize you feel like you could bring the sixes out more and the sevens out more, but that's not necessary. So again, once you have this written down, please make sure you have it looking exactly like this because now I'm gonna show you how electrons actually fill these orbitals, where these electrons live for each of the elements, all right? So what we're gonna do is um, go by what's known as the off-ball principle. The off-ball principle is one of those that was the front of your notes, and it states that electrons are gonna occupy the lowest energy orbitals first. Well, that's great. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as they're gonna fill all of one and then all of two and then all of three. That would be great, but it's not. These overlap. Remember, we're talking about an electron cloud. It's not those perfect rings like in the Bohr model. There's overlapping of where these electrons live. So this is what we're gonna do is we are going to, I'm gonna show you how you can use this chart to figure out the order. All right, so we start up top. I always draw a little dot, not that you have to, it's just kind of the way I do it. The first place electrons are gonna go is the 1s. Then they're gonna to go to the 2s, okay? Then they're gonna to go to the 2p and then the 3s. All right, well, great. So far, I actually am just kind of going in order, but wait, next step after 3s, it's gonna go 3p, then 4s. Then I'm gonna go 3d, 4p, 5s, and again, no reason to memorize this. Use the chart, right? Ooh, and that's not a very straight line, but it should have been. All right, and then here we go. 4F, 5D, 6P, 7S. That's a lot. You don't want to have to memorize that. Use this chart. Okay. All right, so let's see. How are you going to actually use this chart? I give you, um, in your notes, you have the example of nitrogen, and I ask you to write the electron configuration for nitrogen. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my periodic table here. Nitrogen is element seven, all right? And that means that nitrogen has seven protons, and this is an atom of nitrogen, so that means it has seven electrons as well. So your electrons for nitrogen are seven. Well, where do those seven live? The first two live in the 1s2, so I'm gonna write that out, 1s2. Then my next two live in the 2s, so 2s2, because remember I'm filling according to my arrows. I'm now gonna go to the 2p, all right? So there you go with the 2p, but I've already used up four electrons here, okay? And nitrogen has seven, so four so seven minus four means I only have three electrons living in that 2p. That is totally fine. In your electron configuration chart, this is these little numbers, the superscripts rep represent the maximum number of electrons that can live there, all right? So pause this video now and go on ahead and do the example for bromine. All right, so we're back. So here we go, bromine has 35 electrons, okay, so 35 electrons. I decided to write electrons twice. So following that order, this is what you should look like. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and 4p5. Always double check, so I'm two and two, which is four, and six is 10, all right? And then here's another 10, so I'm up to 20. That brings me up to 30 and 35. So I've used my 35 electrons for bromine, and that's what the answer for bromine should be. All right, fantastic. Another place that we're going to use an electron configuration chart is in what's called an electron filling diagram. All right, so take a moment now, please, and pause the video and write the electron configuration for sulfur. Okay, great. Sulfur has 16 electrons. We know that based on the periodic table. I'm gonna write that electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p4. Did you guys get the same one? Hopefully you did. All right, so now for an electron filling diagram, you're gonna do another step. We're gonna use a box to represent each orbital. Now remember, an orbital is a pair of electrons, all right? So S, S's can hold two, so that's a pair, so that gets a box. Any S is gonna get a single box. P's 
can hold three pairs, so they get three boxes, and we tend to connect those boxes together. All right, so my S there, and then another P. If there was a D in this example, the Ds would get five boxes. Fs would get seven boxes. All right, great, so we did step one, we did step two. Now, I'm gonna use arrows to represent electrons of different spin, okay? So, here we go. So, in my 1S um, orbital, in my pair, I have one electron that's spinning in one direction and one electron that's spinning in the other. What matters is that you have arrows going in two different directions. You can start with a down arrow, it doesn't matter. It's a little odd, but it doesn't matter. All right, one up, one down. All right, I always get in the habit, I do all of my up arrows, and then I do my down arrows, one up, one down, and now here we go, I'm at 3P4. So I'm not gonna have arrows all filled up, just like I did back here at the 2P. Here, I'm gonna go, I want my own room, I want my own room, I want my own room, right? And then, oh, I have a leftover one, so now somebody has to pair up. It doesn't matter who pairs up, all right, you could again do the middle or the last one. It's odd, typically you just do it in the way that you read it, all right? And this idea of wanting your own orbital before you're gonna pair up, this is called Hun's rule, okay? Electrons want their own orbital or their own room before they are going to pair up. So what would be wrong in this one is for this last one, let's say, if you did this and you had those four with this being empty that would be incorrect, all right? We're gonna do more practice with this. What's nice is you can choose any element and go on ahead and do this for yourself as a little bit of practice. All right, thanks so much.